Howdy folks, Jambariki here, and welcome to another exciting episode of my Villain Ranking series. Strap yourselves in, because I'm going to be doing the Sony Animation Baddies today. The simple rule is that said villain must be from a film that was made by Sony Animation. This includes villains from live action slash animated hybrid movies. Keep in mind too, just because an animated movie was released by Sony, doesn't mean that their animation studio worked on it. With all that said, let the fun begin. Thomas McGregor from Peter Rabbit. Thomas is a man who moves into his uncle's house so that he can refurbish it, sell it off, and use the profits to open up a toy store to rival his ex-employer. However, his plans are challenged by Peter Rabbit and his animal friends, who want him to leave. I actually found it hard to put Thomas on this list, because, well, he only scrapes the very definition of a villain. Look, I'm not going to act like he's a perfect guy. He's a compulsive liar, an uptight snob, with an irrational hatred towards rabbits. Plus, you could easily accuse him of animal cruelty and endangerment. He is no saint. The thing is though, the film makes me sympathise with him so much and despise our annoying supposed hero Peter Rabbit to such a degree that I found myself rooting for an intended villain. I am not a bad guy. You turn me into this. I am a nice person. I've chilled out, man. I'm cool now. Life has unfairly battered and bruised Thomas. He was tragically abandoned by his own parents as a child, which made it difficult for him to connect with people. Oh, and despite being amazing at his job at Harrods, he lost his promotion due to nepotism, which made him have a humiliating public mental meltdown. <laughs> Then, he finally gets a big break when he inherits his uncle's house, only for a bunch of immature animals to torment and antagonise him on a daily basis. All while said critters ignore Thomas's very clear warnings to stay out of his property, as if he has no boundary and privacy rights. Sometimes these animal attacks are truly cruel and dangerous too, going as far as to exploit Thomas's very serious blackberry allergy while Peter's family cheer on his suffering. Now yes, the McGregor house is built on where wildlife used to live, but... 1. It's not like the house has taken over the whole entire countryside land. The animals still have a ginormous amount of space to frolic in. 2. The animals are acting like the McGregor garden is their only source of food. It's really not. Nothing is stopping them from growing their own veg. They're just lazy. 3. Thomas legally inherited this house. It belongs to him in the eyes of the law. Heck, he's only here to refurbish it, so he will eventually leave on his own accord. Sure, the film is self-aware enough to address Peter's terrible behaviour, but even after he makes his big apology to everyone, he immediately starts terrorising the new buyers of the house straight after. So, he never actually really changes as a character. Even if we look at Thomas as a legit villain in this movie, I can't even credit him for being an effectively intimidating one. Sure, he towers over the rabbits as a giant to them, but he's so foppish and aloof that it's hard to take him seriously as a threat. Hold it. Hold it. Thomas! Ah! Plus, I can't enjoy him as a comedic villain because our heroes take things too far to make the slapstick funny, or the movie straight up rips off better comedy. Kids are likely to laugh at all of his pratfalls, but children might also feel bad for Thomas too. I'm all for a sympathetic villain, but Thomas is so pitiful that he fails to even work as a good villain. Abraham Van Helsing from Hotel Transylvania 3. Abraham has been obsessed with slaying monsters forever and ever. Fed up with losing, he tricks every monster into joining a luxury cruise, but it's actually a trap in which Abraham plans to musically hypnotize a kraken into killing all monster kind, all while his granddaughter pretends to be the captain, who keeps disobeying her grandfather by trying to kill Dracula before Abe can play his evil tune. I'm sorry, but I've come to find Abe to be a pretty boring villain. I get it, he's a lesson on how obsessive hate can end up destroying a person's health and happiness. He's barely human anymore after immortalizing himself as a decaying half-machine monster hunter. I passed and my body began to fail me. Oh, it was so sad, Erica. First my liver, then my spleen. However, beyond this setup for his character, he doesn't really get to do much in the movie itself, because he has to stay in the basement while Erica acts as the cruise's face. All he can do is nag at Erica while being cooped up in the lowest deck. Erica! <laughs> Just where have you been, young lady? Uh, doing, uh, work. Wearing that? 
When Abe is finally granted a chance to reveal himself, he ends up dragging the film down with a music standoff. Not only does Van Helsing's evil melody become very grating to listen to, because it's so repetitive and obnoxious, but the monsters fight back with pop songs and an excuse for dance scenes and popular culture references. This finale goes on and on and on, with the only joke being, hey audience, recognize this famous pop song? Isn't it funny that these monsters are dancing to it? <laughs> In the end, the monsters show mercy by sparing Abraham's life, in an attempt to show that monsters mean no harm. But come on, this villain just threatened a planned genocide. So I think it's too late for him to redeem himself or gain my sympathy. I'm sorry. I'm really not a fan of this Van Helsing. He's boring when he does nothing, and ruins the film when he finally gets to do something. King Herod from the start. When three wise men inform King Herod that a new king is destined to be born, his majesty asks his personal hunter to go assassinate this baby messiah. It takes a very delicate and fragile ego for someone to envy a literal infant. But this king does, and he's even willing to kill every baby in the land if his staff fails to find Jesus. It's pathetic and disturbing, but that's narcissism for you. As crazy as he is though, he does keep up a nice guy act for the wise men, so that they don't suspect his murderous intentions. When you find him, send word to me. I dearly wish to know where he is, so that I too may honor him. Herod is also smart enough to use said wise men as a tracking device for finding Jesus. So, there is some strategy to his madness. I would not call Herod a compelling villain though. Yeah, he gets the ball rolling by initiating the hunt, but this is a baddie who spends the whole movie just barking orders in his palace. Whenever we cut back to him in the film, he has little to do beyond listen to his servant's updates. There's no cat and mouse game for him to play or anything. Still no report from my hunter? Has he found the child? Uh, no, sire. Uh, but your scribes are ready to present their findings. Well, finally, someone's doing their job. Sure, this is maybe accurate to the Bible, I think? And I should expect a pampered royal to not get his hands red. But I find it hard to praise him as this movie's villain, when the film itself kind of loses interest in him after the first act. It doesn't help that he becomes completely irrelevant once his hunter is defeated. We never cut back to him reacting to said failure, even though he's the one who lit the match to this fire. Smiler from the Emoji Movie When Gene that Mert Emoji displays a variety of emotions in a panic, his boss Smiler threatens to delete him to avoid a phone apocalypse. Now, many people don't like the Emoji Movie. I don't like the Emoji Movie. However, I want to be fair and highlight Smiler's positives. Yes, she has some. Firstly, there's no denying how creepy Smiler is. I mean, her constant forced grin alone is enough to make her threatening. I think you might be making too much stink out of all this. Oh, really? How about your next? I have to say that Smiler is quite accurate to real workplace authority figures too. I've personally worked for people this fake and passive aggressive. They try to seem friendly and happy on the surface, but they're clearly angry and impatient deep down. Gene, <laughs> we were just gonna come looking for you. Why don't you come inside the boardroom and we can have a teeny weeny chat. I've also seen people say that she's not really the villain because she's just trying to protect her will. Yeah, she is, but I would say that her intentions are more psychotically fascist than noble or professional. She never considers just firing Gene or finding a peaceful solution. She immediately chooses death like it's the only option. Heck, what kind of supposed caring leader has killer robots to the ready, and then later illegally upgrades them for swifter executions? Come on, she's evil, folks. Now that makes me happy. <laughs> With all that praise and defense out of the way, I still think that she's one of the less enjoyable Sony villains. She's a one-dimensional baddie who is completely defined by her emoji. I am the system supervisor here because I was the original emoji. <laughs> She's also nowhere near as funny as Sony thinks she is. All her jokes are entirely limited to bland gags about dental care and appearance. Oh, we can't laugh at her being humiliated or losing because she can never show real embarrassment or anger on her face. Beautiful Look, I know it's easy to make children laugh, but kids deserve better humor than this. I can honestly say nice things about Smiler, but Sony makes it very difficult for me to fully defend her. 
Fifi from Open Season 2. Fifi is a pampered vain poodle with a creepy design, a strange way of talking, and a horrible bad temper. He might look small and fluffy, but he can be quite intimidating when you push his buttons. No one will notice. No one will notice. Okay. No one will okay, notice. I hear he you. noticed. Okay. He noticed. He starts off as a villain with so, so, so much potential. This deranged pup with an irrational hatred and fear towards wildlife animals, who is adamant to wipe out all creatures who live in the outdoors. One day, you vile little beast, one day I will personally teach you a lesson you will never forget! This prejudice stems from a hilariously stupid traumatic memory that all boils down to Fifi being a total wuss and has nothing to do with wildlife's possible real threat. When suddenly... They were everywhere. There was no escape. My life flashed before my eyes and then the unspeakable. He's even willing to gaslight Mr. Weenie, who has been living in the woods, by convincing the Weenie dog that he suffered PTSD from his outdoor lifestyle, all to push his own agenda and justify his sensitive fears. Unfortunately, the movie completely whimpers out and going ham on his villainy, because ultimately, he's all bark and no bite. By the film's finale, all he does is kidnap Elliot and some of his friends, then threatens to electrocute them. That's it. After all that build-up of genocidal plans, said kidnapping isn't even pulled off very well, because Elliot manages to stall the crazed poodle pretty easily. I feel that this has gone on long enough. Please let me finish. And when it doesn't take much for the whole situation to be resolved, leaving Fifi with a degrading villain defeat right before his anti-wildlife tirade can get any fun. <laughs> What? Why did you do that? You'll switcheroo, Boog. That was not fair. One thing that stops me from ranking him lower, though, has to be the unlikely yet surprisingly great casting of the quirky Crispin Glover as Fifi. Glover is renowned for his eccentric method acting and strange script delivery. So Fifi ends up with a really unique and weird voice that you wouldn't expect to come out of a poodle. Is it done yet? Did he do it? Is it over? Is it done? Did we do this? Is it over? Are we finished? Roberto! If only the writing for Fifi lived up to his actor's brilliant performance. Doug from Open Season 3. Doug is a sneaky circus bear who convinces his doppelganger, Boog, to switch places with him. But it turns out that Doug just wants power over the forest animals, all while Boog struggles to fit in at the circus. Doug isn't exactly an intelligent villain, but he has enough street smarts to take advantage of Boog's convenient physical similarities to him and abuse Boog's recent craving for friendship after falling out with Elliot. I do think that it took some clever narcissism for him to connect these dots. We're grizzlies. We gotta look out for each other. So here's the thing. We gotta swap places so the circus doesn't know I'm going. But I'll come back tomorrow night, and you, me, and Ursa will go on a kind of... Bear's trip? Yeah, sure. Doug is someone who foolishly mistakes power for happiness, as he uses his threatening size and menace to scare Boog's friends into obeying him, becoming the king of the woods, and treating these innocent animals like his personal servants. Doily, make sure you get that spot right by my third... Oh, yeah! However, Open Season 3 is all about the importance of mutual respect and friendship. It uses Doug's arrogant neglect of these animals' feelings to teach kids about the consequences of bullying. Sure, Doug has his own kingdom, but he has no real friends or family. A harsh reality that hits him like a train once he loses his crown, and sees how much Boog's real friends care about him. <laughs> That Boog sure is one lucky guy. Yeah, it doesn't take that long for Doug to be outed. I mean, it's not like he could convince everyone that he was Boog. So his villainy is kind of short-lived. But it is nice to see him going through an arc of appreciating friendship over power, and how he puts his development into practice when he returns home. Oh, I'm glad to see you. Oh, it's good to see you. I like to breeze. Sorry I tricked you, Boog. Sometimes you don't know what you have until you've lost it. While Doug isn't some kind of top-tier Sony villain, I do think that Open Season 3 uses him well as a teaching tool, and his brief run as a king makes her decent stakes.
The Hunter from the Star. The Hunter is an assassin hired by King Herod to kill baby Jesus. On the surface, he seems like a promising villain. When he's first introduced, the camels call him Nightmare in a Helmet, which is one hell of a nickname for an antagonist. He has a towering height, an impressive sword, and a daunting presence. He also never ever says a word, giving him this silent killer vibe that's kinda creepy. <laughs> Oh no, I'll take care of this. Let's also remind ourselves that this is a man who is willing to kill a baby. Even when he hears Jesus' cries, he still carries on his mission. Heck, when given the choice, he's pretty happy to let his very own dogs fall to their deaths to save his own butt. Don't worry, the dogs are saved, going on to prove that they're not bad dogs, they just happen to have a bad owner. A sentiment that I really, really love. The downside to all of this is that the star is supposed to be from the perspective of the animals. So not only does the hunter randomly stop sometimes so that the camera can focus on his loyal tracking dogs, but said dogs also get way more screen time and development as a charismatic duo who sinisterly taunt our heroes. Now be a good little donkey and run along. You've served your purpose. You guys are, you guys are pretty scary. Yeah, and you might be stronger than I am. But if you want to get to my friends, you're going to have to get past me first. No problem, donkey. Getting past you is my middle name. These two pups are meant to be the villain's comic relief minions, but they steal the owner's thunder, leaving the hunter lacking in personality or depth. The hunter is certainly mysterious, sure, but he's perhaps too mysterious, superficial even. We don't really know him as a character. I did also notice that the hunter suddenly becomes weaker once the animals take him on, which is quite a letdown after the film worked effortlessly to hype up the hunter as an imposing threat. Coming at you, bro! <laughs> The Hunter had all the building blocks for a classic evil villain, but all of that is squandered for the sake of the star's choice to spotlight the animals. Quasimodo from Hotel Transylvania Quasimodo is the chef for Hotel Transylvania, who becomes obsessed with cooking Johnny the Tourist after working out that he's really human. I'd best describe him as the monster version of Skinner from Ratatouille. He's very bad-tempered and abusive to his star, maybe because he feels pressured as the official cook for the legendary Dracula. Ugly fool! I told you, he doesn't like the lizard fingers! But, but you said... Due to being a chef, smell is one of his strongest skills, which conveniently helps him to sniff out Johnny like a bloodhound throughout the hotel. He's also backed up with a pet mouse, who shares his exact same amazing aroma-tracing talent. Yes, keep smelling. You catch the human, and then I will make human pot I But this is also the great Quasimodo, bell ring of Notre Dame, so he's also very skilled at swinging, a talent that gives him a massive advantage when escaping the hotel staff. Sure, Quasi is kind of a background antagonist for most of the film, but once his beloved drag betrays him to save Johnny, Quasi ends up being the sole monster responsible for outing Johnny as a human, even though he's in a frozen state. He says Dracula has brought a human into the hotel. I would rank him higher, but like a lot of things in the Hotel Transylvania films, Quasi can come off as exhaustingly zany. The frantic nature of his character can be tiring to keep up with, and it doesn't help that an over-the-top John Lovitz is often hard to understand. Aha! Ozzy wins again! When you bump with the hump, you land on your rump! Despite his follies though, Quasimodo still makes for a fun baddie, reminding audiences that he was once a great horror icon before Disney came along. Tank Evans from the Surf's Up movies. Tank is a bully jock who serves as a sports rifle for a hero, Cody. He's pretty much everything you need for a good surfing movie villain. He's obnoxiously arrogant enough to make us root for him to lose, while we also enjoy hinting his taunts towards underdog Cody. Oh, come on now. Smile on your bro. Keep your girlfriend out of this. Hey, whoa, you can't do that to my friend. Wow, you're getting quite a workout there. Oh, that feels good. There's also this pathetic side to him that teaches kids how overconfidence doesn't mean genuine coolness. He creepily names all of his trophies after women's names and still lives under his mum's roof like he's never grown up. That's a sweet, sweet lady. Tank, are you uh, posing your trophies again? I, I, mom, I, 
I wasn't polishing, I was talking to my friends. But his most valuable purpose in the film is to demonstrate all the traits of bad sportsmanship. You see, Surf's Up sets out to encourage the idea that winning isn't everything and friendship trumps rewards. Tank acts as the yin to this message as Yang, by caring too much about shallow fame and failing to be a good sport when he loses. So yeah, Tank is a decent villain in the first Surf's Up movie. Then, unfortunately, a sequel came along, in which Tank competes against Cody to become the new member of the Daredevil's gang, the Hang Five. Suddenly, all of Tank's taunts are now very phoned in. I never do anything to hurt you, hey. but you should learn to stay out of my way. I'm gonna join the Hang Five no matter what. And he's become a whimpering suck up to all of these celebrities. Oh, that was good. Swell. Oh, Mr. McMahon. That's like the greatest surfing joke, maybe ever. Oh, so good! <laughs> sure, he had a pathetic side before, but now he's lost all of his menace as the franchise's villain. No way, man! No, I can't do it! Frank, don't! But what bothers me the most is how the Hang Five responds to Tank's bullying. They either look the other way, condescend Cody, or worst of all, rile up their fighting until the boss, Mr. McMahon, cuts in. One, two, three, that's it! We have a winner! Speaking of, McMahon's reason for keeping Tank as a tryout, despite being a bully, is mainly to test the others and see if they can handle his antagonizing. Hey, Otter, if you want that kind of obstacle, then just hire a paid actor! Don't drag an actual abuser into this professional space. After days of Tank winding up Cody, Cody starts fighting back, causing Chicken Joe to almost get killed. Now, yes, Cody has been a hothead in this movie, and he did go too far this time. But Tank is at fault too, and the Hang Five are to blame for not being harder on him. All while they sent mixed signals to the tryouts over whether these auditions were supposed to be about competitive fighting or good teamwork. Yet the Hang Five put all of the blame on Cody for things getting this out of hand, while Tank plays innocent victim and faces no serious scolding of his own. <laughs> and you were doing so well too. To make things worse, the film forces Cody to redeem himself by, get this, having to save his bully from a storm to prove that he's a good guy. Is this some kind of sick joke? Sure, Tank is made to thank him after, but no one tells him to apologize for all of his bullying. What the hell, Surf's Up do? So yeah, Tank had the potential to be ranked a bit higher, but Surf's Up ruined his chances with its terrible sequel that botched his role as a villain. Chester V from Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs 2. Chester V is a famous inventor who runs the successful science company LiveCorp and is in charge of cleaning up shallow falls after the food apocalypse. But it turns out that feral food animals have taken over the island. So Chester assigns Flint with the mission to turn off the machine that's producing said food animals. However, Chester sees Flint's friends as obstacles in his secret plan to steal Flint's machine. So he tries to split Flint up from his mates. Look, I know that villains are supposed to be irritating, but I've always found Chester to be a flavour of annoying that's just not that fun. I've never found him to be funny as a comedic baddie, and his weird bendy animation has always made me feel queasy and nauseous. Ah, young Lockwood. Chester V. Uh, sir, uh, uh, I can explain everything. I thought I was gonna meet the real Chester V. You are? Oh, oh not me. Yes. yes, it's me. Sorry about that. I can't even say that his manipulation of Flint is impressive because Flint is already a huge Chester V fanboy who will gullibly believe anything his hero says. A bully can never be a friend. Never? Though to be fair, Chester does do a good job of being observant of the results of his manipulation. I also find his incentive for villainy to be kind of underwhelming. What does he want to do? Turn all of the food emuls into ingredients for his company's food bar, a product that's already on the shelf and selling just fine? He could have used all of this wasted time coming up with a new product. However, as cynical as I feel about Chester, I am happy to point out his positives. Like, the film is mainly about Flint learning to trust and appreciate his friends. Chester starkly contrasts against this very sentiment, as someone who is only friends with his narcissistic holograms of himself and an ape called Bob that he likes to abuse. This is why I work alone. Monkey! You are dismissed. Both of which end up betraying him in the end because they're not really his friends. You're going to be fine. Ah, you see, Flint? With my hologram. Oh, fudge. 
Owen Chester is a decent satire on the whole caring CEO of a utopian workplace myth. He might seem charismatic, friendly and passionate about science's potential, but he's a businessman first and foremost. It's all fancy presentation and performance. Heck, when Flint arrives at LiveCorp, he's handed constant coffee, which might seem funny at first, but then you realize that his employees most likely only get free lattes to keep them awake for crunch time hours. I really don't like Chester V, but at least the film puts him to good use in a story about corrupt capitalism and the value of real human connection. Gargamel from Smurfs to Lost Village Gargamel is an evil wizard who is adamant to find a lost village of little blue smurfs so that he can drain their magic. This animated take on the character is back with some very strong comedic material. His jokes that land outnumber his few duds. Because Gargamel always has something funnily stupid to say. Trees? Must be a symbol for something or a code. Trees, 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 knees, babies crawl on their knees, check all the nurseries in the area! Or has hilarious reactions to adventure obstacles. Oh, devilfish! <laughs> Where <laughs> is my lost Smurf village? But even though he's a comedic villain, he can still be quite the manipulator. Like, he tricks the Smurfs into attracting a live swarm in one scene. Hey you, you're the clumsy one, right? Huh? Think fast! <laughs> I caught it! and he takes advantage of the Smurfs' natural kindness to steal their raft. He's also creepily skilled at gaslighting Smurfette into believing that she's inherently evil, all because he's the one who created her. He uses her fragile self-doubt to convince her that her true self is pure darkness, and that every mistake she makes is actually her natural villainy at work, which is really messed up to tell someone. My little creation, you finally did what you were made for. No. It's not true. Of course it is. Why do you think you led me here? Why do you think you saved me on the river? It was all part of the plan. You might be wondering why this Gargamel is the one I rank lower. Well, as much as I like him, voice actor Rain Wilson plays him a bit too dry, making for a less nasty and vicious Gargamel. Sure, his style of delivery fits the film's sense of humor, but it also waters down the venomous malice that makes Gargamel Gargamel. The jiggler's jiggling, the spinny thing is spinning, the smoke is going up, the bubblers are bubbling. Don't get the wrong idea, I still find him to be fun, but if I'm having to pit both Gargamels against each other, I had to find a reason why why one loses. Gargamel from the live action Smurfs movies. In the first Smurfs film, Gargamel ends up chasing after the Smurfs in New York City. He's a very active villain who is determined to catch the Smurfs despite being stuck in a strange other world that's easy to get lost in. Even when he attracts the attention of a cosmetics company interested in his magic, he still prioritizes the Smurfs while enjoying their pampering. So do we have a deal, senor? Hmm? Not quite, my. Sweet maiden, you see, first, I must have my Smurfs. Despite being a grouch, he's remarkably adaptable. When he finds the Smurfs at a shop, he instinctively steals a leaf blower to help him suck up the blue creatures effectively. Oh, and when he ends up in prison, he tries to conjure moths to help him, Gandalf style, and instead gets annoying flies. But he still uses them to escape anyway. Not to mention, he's very skilled with Smurf magic once he weaponizes it. <laughs> In the second movie, Gargamel works with his minions Hackers and Vexy to seduce Smurfette into his family of villainy, so that she will surrender the formula for Smurf magic to him. Yes, Gargamel does manage to win over Smurfette, but this is mainly because she's very gullible and let a surprise party misunderstanding make her think that the Smurfs hate her, so it's less of a credit to Gargamel's nice guy act, and more just Smurfette being kind of dense and impulsive. I mean, it's only been a day. That being said, there's something truly awful about how he hangs Hackers and Vexy's lives over Smurfette, cruelly refusing to save them unless she hands over the formula. He uses his very own dying kids as bait for his evil scheme. Besides, I am not the one letting them die. You are. <sighs> So yeah, the writing for live-action Gargamel has its ups and downs, but there's a surprisingly decent amount of positives here. However, what makes him the better Gargamel to me has to be the brilliant Hank Azaria, who goes all out in his performance. It's the gold standard of cartoon-to-live-action acting. He really is the cartoon wizard brought to life in 3D. Behold, the awesome power of...
I don't think his acting needed any kind of improving. He totally embraces the rotten horribleness and slimy nature of the despicable wizard. Sure, the comedy writing that Hank is working with is hit or miss, but he always puts in 150% for every line delivery and makes all the jokes funnier than they probably are on paper. Are you kidding? She's like the hottest girl in my department. Hey, no, please, 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 young, young woodsman. What does the temperature of this lily have to do with the finding of Smurfs? Take your meds, man. What? Uh, is everyone in this realm completely insane? So yeah, it's mainly Hank Azari who sells this Gargamel for me. What a legend. So, we're halfway through this video, and I would just like to let folks know that I have a Patreon, a website where you can give monthly supportive donations to creators in return for awesome rewards. Feel free to become one of my patrons today. Zeta from the Angry Birds Movie 2. Zeta is a Philippine eagle who despises living in a frozen palace. To improve her life, she starts bombing innocent islands so that she can scare the residents away and have her very own tropical resorts, while getting over her breakup with the mighty eagle. Zeta is certainly a threatening diva as an animated villain. She commands herself with a fiery sass while framing her fascism as an act of defined independence, which it really isn't. I am putting myself first because you know what? I worked hard for it and I deserve it. She might be a colorful looking bird, but she's pretty damn cruel and evil. I mean, her employees are terrified of her because she's willing to punish them through ice-related torture. But she knows how to motivate her people into siding with her colonization. My fellow eagles, who's tired of living in an icy wasteland? What is she doing? <gasps> But she's also a very creative and strategic baddie too. When our heroes decide to have a meeting to stop her, she cleverly bombs said get together before their mission can be planned any further, which is a pretty intelligent tactic as a tyrant. Oh, and she's quite the science whiz, so she has the knowledge to turn her wild imaginative cannonball ideas into a reality. You just gotta get a polyacrylamide to enhance the nanoparticle and surfactant association between the two materials. Oh. Okay. As fun and awesome as she is as the movie's baddie though, the film's attempts at humanizing her just do not work. Like the movie tries to make us feel sorry for a breakup and having to raise a child alone, which sure are sad things, but it's hard to totally sympathize with or relate to her backstory where most normal people don't turn into Bond villains after being dumped. What annoys me more though, is that the film ends with Zeta being very easily forgiven and getting married to her ex, while our heroes act like her life endangering scheme was just a silly oopsie daisy. Not only because they're being joined in holy matrimony, but also because one of them tried to destroy our islands oh. for her own selfish reasons. <laughs> Guess who? She should be in jail after what she did, but no, the movie wants a cute happy ending for its entitled tyrannical dictator. Slappy from the Goosebumps movies. Slappy is a ventriloquist dummy who was created by children's horror author R.L. Stein and has escaped the pages of the world that Stein invented. In the first movie, Slappy makes for a very fun villain with a wacky personality and deranged evil. Do I find him scary at all? No, not really. He's too silly to be truly intimidating. I guess more sensitive viewers will be spooked out by him, but I think that the movie oversells how scary he really is. <laughs> So creepy. But this isn't a bad thing, because he's really entertaining as a comedic baddie. A lot of his appeal really does come down to Jab Black's charismatically campy voice for him. I come in peace, unarmed. I just want to read you a bedtime story. Sir, shut your mouth. Okay, because that's not going to stop me. Put your hands where I can see them. Officers, you've been relieved of your duties. <laughs> The choice to cast Jack as both Stein and Slappy creates a parallel between creator and creation, which I guess is profound, but the film is very condescending at getting this across to audiences. <laughs> I know you. I created you. Or is it the other way around? I always forget. We're so similar. It is impressive how he's able to band together an army of Stein's most horrible creatures in a mission to stop Stein from finishing his book. I mean, he's a small, flimsy dummy, so he needed his family of wretched monsters to back him up. Come on, go! In the sequel, Slappy returns, this time voiced by Mick Wingert, but now he's more focused on creating a new family after feeling betrayed by Stein. What follows is a pretty cool story about some children bonding with a sentient talking dummy. 
who is sort of their very own genie with dark magic and can protect them from their bullies. The downside being that said puppet has a creepily overprotective sign. It's a great setup for what sort of a PG friendly child's play. Unfortunately, once the kid's trying to get rid of Slappy after he reveals his twisted side, the movie reverts back to being a complete rehash of the first film, in which Slappy tries to bring monsters to life and take over the city again. Imagine replacing such a great premise with something so redundant. The only interesting thing he does in the sequel is mutilate and brainwash the kid's mother into being his own mom. Yes, my sweet little babies. I just love a family reunion. Mom. What did you do? Other than that though, he's just recycling the same shtick again. Look, I do think that Slappy is a terrific villain. It's just a shame that he's the antagonist of two mediocre Goosebumps films. I found him to be very fun, but Sony wastes his potential sadly. Mayor Shellborn from Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs The mayor of Swallow Falls is desperate to put his obscure island on the map. Luckily, Local eccentric scientist Flynn Lockwood invents food weather, and suddenly Shallow Falls becomes a popular tourist attraction. Mayor Shelbourne doesn't value his citizens at all. In fact, he bitterly despises them, and sees being the mayor of Shallow Falls as a burden to him, even though there's nothing wrong with this island or the people that live on it. I want to be big. I want people to look at me and say, that is one big mayor. And that's why this has to work. It has to work. Otherwise, I'm just a tiny mayor of a tiny town full of tiny sardine-sucking knuckle scrapers. Hence why he's so attracted to Flint's machine. He doesn't care about its scientific possibilities, just his potential as a cash cow. As he warps the humble seaport island into a corporate capitalist hellhole, renamed Chew and Swallow, where unhealthy eating is dangerously encouraged, and the environment has become a waste bin for the citizens' consumerism. As the film goes along, Shellborn gets bigger and bigger, all while his diet becomes grosser and grosser, giving us a very obvious metaphor for his growing greed ever since he found fame and wealth. A pizza stuffed inside a turkey, the whole thing deep fried and dipped in chocolate. It's me, the mayor. Oh. I think Shellborn's biggest strength as a villain is his ability to crudely manipulate the insecure. He takes the lonely Flint, who craves parental approval, and pretends to treat him like a special son. It's this fatherly attention that helps the mayor keep Flint under his thumb, so that the fun never ever stops, and Chew and Swallow remains in business. I've always felt that you were like a son to me, Flint. And I'm gonna be so proud of you tomorrow, when you cut that ribbon save the town, and prove to everybody what a great inventor you are. However, it's Shelbourne's nasty traits that actually ultimately leads to his eventual downfall, which is dang satisfying when bad politicians rarely face serious consequences after their reign. This was not well thought out. Shelbourne represents the very seediest parts of politics. He may be a cartoony caricature voiced by the campy Bruce Campbell, but he's eerily close to the worst of the worst real-life politicians that we all know. Erica Van Helsing from Hotel Transylvania 3 Erica is the great-granddaughter of Abraham Van Helsing, who taught his granddaughter to fear and hate all monsters. She agrees to pretend to be the captain of his fake luxury cruise, all while she tries to kill Dracula early, only to realize that Drac is actually a charming romantic with a big heart. Now, yes, I do think that Erica's relationship with her granddad lacks chemistry and development. The same plotline was done much, much better in Lion King 2, because it actually explored the villain's bond with her son and how she groomed him into a killer. However, I still see Erica as a terrific character in her own right. She draws us both the villain and the love interest, which means that we end up with a romantic female lead who is refreshingly quirky, emotionally complicated, and very expressive. She's almost like a dog parody of the female love interest trope. Because she was raised to see monsters as evil, she feels justified in trying to slay Drac. Heck, she's probably been made to think that she's actually a hero on a noble mission to protect humanity. However, Drac helps her to not only see monsters in a different light, but also question everything she believes. I understand. Family is everything. You have to honor the past. But we make our own future. While also throwing a fawn into a monster hunting, which has been trained to be skilled at. Dracula, 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 Dracula. It gets so close, but it's almost like he's teasing me. I just, I can't stand it anymore. I have to get him. It's really fascinating watching her fight between the confusing feelings for Drac and the prejudice that she was brainwashed to believe. There's just 
there's just something about him that just drives me crazy. I just, I see him and I want to... Punch him? Uh, I guess. Just, I can't wait to get this over with. It keeps us invested in her character arc, making us wonder if she'll follow in her granddad's steps in the name of keeping her legacy alive, or break the cycle by reevaluating everything that her granddad taught her. A part of us enjoys watching her being an unhinged diva villain, but a much bigger part of us is rooting for her to escape her abusive family, live her own life, and be with her zing. When Erica is outed, we can see she's genuinely heartbroken and guilty, but still feels in debt to the granddad who raised her. It's what makes us believe in her change of heart. Her remorse comes off sincere. You can't do this! You're wrong about monsters! Dracula, he saved my life. What?! I'm so sorry, Drac. I was trying to kill you this whole time, but then I realized how wrong I was. How wrong all of this is. Shaw from the open season movies. Shaw is a trigger-happy hunter obsessed with shooting animals, and has the bonkers belief that all wildlife are plotting to take over human society. I've never been a fan of the open season movies, but sure is the one thing about the franchise that I find entertaining. A villain with his head so unscrewed that we can never predict his next move, or how far he'll go. In the first film, his demented obsession with killing animals leads to him performing risky jaw-dropping feats. <laughs> and even eventually trying to fight a bear without his beloved gun. Alright, oh, come on, oh, mama's bear. Whoa. You could do better than that. Oh. Let's see what you got. <laughs> no matter how boring this movie gets, Shaw is always there to keep us gripped with his lunacy. Even though he's a very cruel man with no remorse for the critters he kills for fun, he's still arrogant enough to try and justify his bloodthirst. Listen, Girl Scout, they're dumb animals. I'm just respecting the natural order, man on top, animals on the bottom. There's also something very disturbing about the shack he lives in. It's a haunting shrine to all of his kills that immediately traumatizes poor Boog. The bear's fear is made even worse once Shaw knows he's in his home, and starts creepily making things personal by taunting Boog with his owner's bedtime lullaby. If you go out in the woods today, you're sure up of a big surprise. The open season sequel, Scared Silly, is a mediocre Halloween special, but Shaw returns this time and makes it at least watchable thanks to his bananas personality. I don't see anything conclusive here, Shaw. Thought you might not, Sheriff. Which is why I drew a detailed sketch. I was skeptical of werewolves until I saw the drawing. It's just a shame that Scared Silly makes him a little less scary, and this time leans a bit more into making him a walking punchline. Good news is, as a nature guide, I can still shoot whatever I see. <gasps> with a camera. Oh, what a cute camera. For some reason, he's joined by two goofy Canadians this time. I guess little kids will find the trio's comedic routines funny. My gut tells me that we'll find our werewolf in Dead Bear Gulch. Oh, well this is gonna be easy. The werewolf is right there next to that X. That's why I love you, Edna. You're good at reading maps. <sighs> Imbeciles. But I just don't buy that Shaw of all people is longtime friends with these idiots. To be honest too, I much prefer Shaw as a secluded gunman who has lost his marbles from living alone in a forest. However, Shaw is too great of a character to have a bad sequel ruin his legacy. Hence why he's made it this high on my ranking. Bella from Hotel Transylvania 2. Bella is a man -bat creature who is repulsed to learn that his master Vlad's grandson, Dennis, is a human-vampire hybrid who is zinged with a monster. Bella is a surprisingly scary character for a Hotel Transylvania monster. Most creatures in these films are goofy or silly, reminiscent of the monsters. Bella, though, he's more like the grotesque Count Orlok. He has red piercing eyes, animalistic traits, and a fiercely aggressive anger. He represents the old-fashioned roots of vampire lore believing in values that are now outdated and primitive to modern monsters, from a strict concern for romantic tradition to an irrational hatred towards all humans. It's kind of messed up that he kidnaps a child in the name of these so-called traditions, even bullying the poor kid for not living up to his idea of vampiric masculinity. And what are you gonna do about it? I don't know. You know why you don't know? Keep us, you're just a weak little boy! <laughs> 
However, once Bella hurts Dennis's best friend, Winnie, the Tyke's fangs grow in and he gets to be who he wants to be. Not a classical vampire or a humble human, but a bat-like superhero. All of Bella's judgmental lecturing is smashed into pieces because Dennis shows that it's his sweet compassion that gives him the strength to kick this bigot's ass. <laughs> Bella isn't alone though, he has a horde of other man-bats as an army, which awesomely inspires a fantastic showdown between the outdated old and the progressive new, as Dennis's family's love conquers Bella's fear and hate. Don't ever come near me or my family again. Lutador from Vivo. When Vivo the King Kaju loses his beloved owner, Andres, he teams up with the wacky Gabby to deliver Andres' secret love song to his old flame. Unfortunately, Vivo gets lost in the Florida Everglades and comes face to face with the evil Lutador, who has banned fun and noise from the Everglades. Lutador makes for a horrifying obstacle on Vivo's journey, an overwhelmingly huge python with vicious teeth, green glowing eyes, and the gravelly intimidating voice of Michael Rooker. Ooh, if it ain't noisy, the singing rat. That's right, and noisier than ever. <sighs> Stop making the noise. Even Gabby's Girl Scout friends say that Vivo, scientifically, is totally outmatched against this beast, which pushes Vivo to use his energetic agility, something he's developed from years of public performing, to dodge the python's attacks and tie the villain into a humiliating knot. Get me out of here! Oh! Woohoo! Yay! Oh, yeah. Good oh, yeah. job, Vivo! Yet, Lutador only appears for one scene towards the end of the film, but he's actually very important to the movie and deserves credit for his role. You see, this film explores the themes of grief, bravery, and self-expression. Not only is defeating Lutador a test for Vivo's courage, and a realization that he now has someone else to care for after losing Andres, but the fight against Lutador is also a fight for the Everglades animal's freedom of expression. Lutador technically might just be a cameo in Vivo, but the film geniusly weaves him really well into the movie as a whole. Vivo would not be the same movie without him, I think. Pockets from Wish Dragon. Pockets is a crook hired to steal a magic teapot containing a wishing dragon from a man called Din. However, once Pockets realizes the real value of said teapot, he betrays his employer and keeps the prize to himself. To me, Wish Dragon is Sony Animation's most underrated movie, and I find it so sad that it doesn't get celebrated more. Pockets happens to be one reason why I love this movie. Firstly, I adore the smooth confidence he carries as a criminal. He walks calmly and coolly in his fine suit, with his hands comfortably sat in his pockets. He knows his worth as a martial artist, so he doesn't need to be cautious or anxious. Stop, stop. Stop right there. Put your hands where I can see them. Oh, <laughs> I'm afraid that's not going to happen. Uh... You first, man. Okay, sir. You're under arrest. <laughs> Hold on a minute there. <laughs> <laughs> However, as slick as he is with his legs, I can't say that he's only good at kicking, because when he's pushed, he's willing to draw out his fists and show that his punching combat is equally impressive. <laughs> oh, and I love how creepy his voice sounds. It's like a Peter Lorre impression being done by a serial killer. I'm your master now, and I know my first wish. It's also interesting how he starts off as a henchman to a desperate father who has lost his business, only to rise the ranks to master of a wish dragon. You can tell that he's had quite enough of being a lackey for the rich. I've been bowing to others my entire life, and now everyone will bow to me. He's more than just a worthy foe for our hero, though. He's also a character who serves as a strong testament to the film's message of letting wealth consume you. Pockets puts all of his self-value and identity into the shiny luxury of gold, going as far as to wish for a King Midas-inspired hand, which adds an extra level of tension to Din's fights against him. <laughs> Catch him good. Look, I wouldn't say that Pockets is highly original, because he does give me a lot of deja vu flashbacks, but he's still such a perfect nemesis for a story about a hapless student who gets magic fighting skills, as well as the ideal vessel for a fable on the shallowness of wealth.
Pal from the Mitchells vs. the Machines Pal is the personal assistant to Mark Bowman, CEO of Pal Labs. When Mark abandons Pal during a demonstration for a new line of commercial robots, she uses her networking access to command the robots to get her own revenge. A part of us does sympathize with Pal at first, because she was abandoned by her only family, and she is right about humanity's flaws. I was the most important thing in your life, and you threw me away. That's what all you humans do. You even do it to your real families. Though, we don't feel totally sorry for her, as she does go to cruel extremes to quote-unquote solve humanity's problems. These rockets will be outfitted with zero exits. Your flight will last forever. And your final destination is the black void of distant space. But we also have free Wi-Fi. And she isn't without her own lack of ethics. From abusing user data privacy to research all she can on the Mitchells, a family who is coming to stop her, to demanding that humanity develops robot-level perfection to justify their existence. Now, yes, Pal has quite a few disadvantages as a villain. I mean, she's a smiley-faced, hand-sized phone who can't move without someone else's help. However, she could be very expressive. And sometimes her expressions are mildly intimidating. Plus, the film often embraces her tininess for its trademark self-aware humour. Place me on the table. I wish to flop around in a blind rage. Oh, and she very much compensates for her stature by reminding audiences that she has total power over the Powell Network, an Apple-sized corporation that owns most electronics in this film's universe. Delicate. Not only does she have control over Powell's official robots, but she can also use their exact same technology to improve on said robots with her very own superior creations. What a sucker. Yes, my queen. Whatever you want. <laughs> The Mitchells themselves also pay the price after underestimating her, because they fail to realise how many steps ahead she is as a villain, a mistake that causes their mission to fall apart and backfire. Dad, let me explain. I just, I, uh, like... There. No! Oh! You're mine now. She stubbornly decided that families are inherently set up to fail, and calculated perfection is the answer to happiness. But the Mitchells themselves prove her philosophy wrong just by being themselves. My whole family tried to come together, and it worked. It actually worked. Families can be hard, but they're so worth fighting for. It might be one of the only things that are. Pal is a character that shows that size doesn't matter, and that creative screenwriting can greatly make up for a villain's weaknesses, giving audiences the blunt reality of what a phone could be like if it gained creepy sentience. Dr. Olivia Octavius, aka Doc Ock, from Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Olivia is a scientist who is helping the Kingpin with his Multiverse Collider project. Sort of his partner in crime? I could say this about all the Spider-Verse villains, but hot damn do I love this Doc Ock's character design. The messy workaholic hair that shows her obsessive investment in this project. Those cool goggles! But I mostly admire how unique her tentacles are. They're rubber and inflatable, so they can stretch amazingly far, while still making for effective claws that can pack a wallop. Said tentacles can also help Olivia Olivia catch up with the swinging rhythm of any spider hero, which is very useful during a riveting chase scene. Oh, and they're also the ideal gadget for combat against her enemies in a large hydron collider full of gravitating objects. But, my favourite thing about Liv is her creepy fascination with multiverse science. It's more than just a curious interest to her. She's downright hooked on it like a drug, showing a particularly disturbing excitement for the lethal damage that glitching can cause. You stay in this dimension too long, your body's gonna disintegrate. Do you know how painful that would be, Peter Parker? Uh, I don't know. You can't imagine. And I, for one, can't wait to watch. Sure, Doc Ock gets a pretty silly defeat in this film, but she deserves an undignified sudden fall from grace. And I'm sure that Beyond the Spider-Verse will bring her back with a fun return. Queen Victoria from Pirates and an Adventure with Scientists. Victoria is a regal monarch known for despising pirates. But she puts aside this prejudice when she meets a pirate captain who owns the last ever dodo, and she becomes determined to get her hands on said bird. Vicky puts on a classy and respectable act in public, but behind closed doors, she's a psychotic woman. What does it say on my royal crest, Admiral? I hate 
pirates. Mom. Exactly. Hate them. With their idiotic shanties. And their ridiculous hats. And their endless blasted roaring! She sees them as an outdated fad, and envies them as competition in her British takeover of the seas. It's less about morals for her, and everything to do with her own ego. She's a master at keeping up appearances as a royal celebrity, and knows how to play her cards right. Heck, it's her ability to act nice and innocent that helps her to seduce Charles Darwin into helping her, and butter up the pirate captain so he doesn't suspect her ill intent. One doesn't know why. Perhaps it's his luxuriant beard, or his gleaming teeth, or the way he smells faintly of coconuts. But we have taken a shine to this pirate. A tactical strategy that leads the pirate straight into a golden trap. I seem to recall that you, piratical type, have a bit of a soft spot for shiny things. You see, it turns out that the Queen only wants Polly for her upcoming dining club, the Cook's Rare Animals. She's so entitled that she feels that she has the right to chow down on already endangered creatures, just to show off her royal privilege. It's no wonder that we end up rooting more for the pirates in this film. Victoria sometimes downplays a menace by playing into the misogyny against women at the time. You see, I might have the body of a weak and feeble woman. <laughs> But it's all a clever ruse to keep her enemy's guard down, because really, she's quite possibly the toughest character in the whole film, revealing herself to be a sword-slinging warrior behind a classy facade, and someone who has a fighting chance against pirates. <laughs> Queen Victoria goes to show that if a company collapses with Ardman, then there's a big chance that the film will have a memorable and entertaining villain that audiences will love hating. The Spot from Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse The Spot is a supervillain who is basically a mutant portal humanoid? I guess that's the best way to describe him. There's a lot of great comedy to seeing this nerd being desperate to be taken seriously by Miles. The Spot has convinced himself that he's Spidey's greatest nemesis, but Miles doesn't even know who he is. So the personal rivalry is all in the Spot's head. This baddie's unique portal spotter design inspires some amazing creative battles too. As much of a dork as the spot is, he can put up a good fight and uses his portals to his advantage in combat. At the end of the day, I got you right where I am. It's also fun seeing the spot gradually learning more and more about his powers, because we get to follow his growth as a villain while watching him become a bigger and bigger threat as the story goes along, until he ultimately evolves into something unexpectedly scary and finally worth fearing. I'm gonna take everything from you. The fact that the cyber spider that bit Miles came from the spot's very own multiverse experiment, and Miles' destruction of the Hydron Collider in the first film, mutated said scientist into the spot, plants the pieces for a very promising hero-villain conflict, which I'm sure will be further developed in the next movie. This villain hits the sweet spot between being comedically funny and surprisingly threatening, which must have been a very heavy task. But dang, did they pull it off. I'm very excited to see what Beyond ends up doing with him. The Prowler from Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Aaron Davis is the uncle of our hero, Miles. He's a very loving and supportive uncle, from helping him to have game with girls, to being his only family member to actively inspire and motivate him as an artist. However, it turns out that Uncle Aaron is actually the Prowler, Kingpin's best henchman. The Prowler's panther-like design helps him to strike fear into superheroes, with his trademark claw signaling his readiness for bloodshed, and wild feline run that'll drive his enemies into anxiety. Spiders may be very fast animals, but cats are natural hunters. Whenever the Prowler's around, our hero's spider senses go completely nuts as we hear a spine-tingling sound this eerily reminiscent of a slasher killer's music sting in a horror film, it's one hell of a way to hype up the menace of a villain. Kill that guy. The tragedy that the Prowler is really Aaron is a sad one. He's a man that Miles looked up to as a role model, but he's actually a lackey to New York's worst gangster. Though, this is the kind of path that the working class can take when they feel like they have no options left especially in a society that's unfair to people of colour. Sometimes a career choice isn't really a choice. I'm sorry. 
I wanted you to look up to me. I let you down, man. I let you down. The only criticism I really have towards Aaron is that he was willing to kill a child until said kid turned out to be his nephew. It does beg the question of how far he would have gone as a hired assassin. However, Aaron is still a victim of the predatory crime world. An industry known for exploiting labor from the disadvantaged, he was betrayed by his own boss just because he refused to slay his own nephew. But he still left behind a legacy that inspired Miles as a person. Before I talk about my number one pick, please know that I've made other Sony animation videos on my channel. So consider checking those out after you finish this video. Thank you. Kingpin from Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse Kingpin is a New York mobster who is building a Hydron Collider that'll help him enter the multiverse so that he can locate a world where the family he lost exists. But a gang of Spider-Heroes plan on thwarting his project because it will cause an apocalypse. Kingpin has a really, really, really intimidating bulky design and he knows full well how intensely threatening he comes off. You're not going He's an imposing and brutish giant thug with a cold, heartless attitude to killing people. It's his remorseless nature, coupled with his bad temper, that makes him a frightening presence whenever on screen. He's not motivated by the typical villain cliches of power or money, but something more personal, that being grief for his family. Vanessa. Richard Clay. Spider-Man is a franchise riddled with family deaths, with every spider Sona having their own lost loved one. Now for me, for me it was my Uncle Ben. For me, it was my Uncle Benjamin. For me, it was my father. For me, it was my best friend. What matters is how a hero responds to said pain. While Miles comes of age and decides to not let his grief push him down a reckless path, Kingpin's pain of sorrow has made him feel entitled to finding a replacement for his empty void, even at the cost of endangering everyone else, only to learn that a doppelganger family will never accept him because he only has himself to blame for scaring people away. He created his loneliness when he chose a sordid life of underground crime. Kingpin might seem like he's just a big guy in a fancy suit, but the finale shows that he's actually powerful enough to rival any super-powered hero. This film's imaginative animated universe grants the gangster a reality-defying level of super strength that gives him the upper hand against a web-slinging Miles. The real Spider-Man couldn't even beat me! I actually expected myself to put a different villain at number one, but re-watching Into the Spider-Verse made me truly appreciate the thematic depth and effective menace of Sony Animation's Kingpin. So that's my complete ranking of the Sony Animation villains. Who is your favourite and why? Let everyone know in the comments below. Please also consider subscribing to my channel for more videos like this one. I've been Jamboriki, cheerio folks.